everybody, welcome to The World This Week, the talk of the town, Netanyahu's speech in Congress. The march is not over yet, Obama says in Selma. Boko Haram, the Nigeria-based Islamist terror group, has pledged allegiance to ISIS. And the tech world gathered in Barcelona this week for the biggest mobile conference in the world. These are some of the issues we'll touch upon this Sunday. We are here now with panelists Professor Yossi Shane of Georgetown and Tel Aviv Universities and Tal Shalev, I-24 News correspondent. Good. Lady and gentlemen, the best show in town. We must always remember, I'll say it one more time, the greatest danger facing our world is the marriage of militant Islam with nuclear weapons. To defeat ISIS and let Iran get nuclear weapons would be to win the battle, but lose the war. We can't let that happen. We all have a responsibility to consider what will happen when Iran's nuclear capabilities are virtually unrestricted and all the sanctions will have been lifted. Iran would then be free to, to build a huge nuclear capacity that could produce many, many nuclear bombs. Professor Shine, was this a success? Success in the eyes of whom? Well, I'm asking you. <laughs> Look, certainly this is a controversial speech. It kind of like created, uh, I would say, an enthusiasm among Bibi's supporters and among some Republicans, but it also created really sadness and I would say deep criticism among Democrats and proponents of President Obama. It was seen by some as a in direct intervention in American foreign policy, in fact, debunking the present policy, by others as a warning, putting Netanyahu as a world leader with sounding sort of like the alarm for everybody in the world. This is a huge kind of like difference in terms of the approach. One is seen as an exaggeration, self-serving. The other is world leader. And this is something that brings lots of people to be supportive and against in a very intense manner. Ta, how did it play in Israel? Well, in Israel, uh, it played, uh, if you ask Netanyahu, he was very satisfied. He was uh, satisfied to get this venue. He was, uh, he got a rock star reception, one he would never get here in Israel with all of the standing ovations. And uh, the Congress did give him a very warm embrace from Netanyahu's, of course, Republican uh, allies in Congress. But on the other hand, the speech did not create the, uh, dr the dramatic uh, uh, b boost that Netanyahu was hoping to get in the polls. It only, at the moment, we only see that the speech has given a minor, has given Netanyahu a minor minor gain in the polls and not the dramatic boost he was hoping for. All right, let's see one unsatisfied person. Keep in mind that when we shaped that interim deal, Prime Minister Netanyahu made almost the precise same speech about how dangerous that deal was going to be. And yet over a year later, even Israeli intelligence officers and in some cases members of the Israeli government have to acknowledge that in fact it has kept Iran from further pursuing its nuclear program. What do we see, the President of the United States on the defensive? The President of the United States is upset, and many of his cabinet members, including Secretary Kerry, what they are saying to us, Netanyahu is irreliable. Netanyahu's message has been diluted, the American public and the Israeli public. Kerry even said, remember Netanyahu pushing for the Iraqi war, and look what happened there. The administration is leery about the possibility of upstaging the president. And they, what they want to do is to dissociate themselves from Netanyahu, but not from Israel. So they want to say, look, we have a problem with Jerusalem, but only with Netanyahu. He is not a person we can work with, and it's maybe undercutting relation with Israel, but our commitment to and, and, and inhibit Iran's developing a nuclear weapon is absolutely a forceful one, and our commitment to Israel is steadfast. All right, we are just, what, about 10 days before elections in Israel, a very, very intense campaign uh, here in Israel, Tal. And uh, where are we standing? Where are we standing now? Well, we're standing in a stagnation, actually, because both the, the leading parties, both the Likud and the Zionist Union, led by uh, Yitzhak Herzog, are both standing on probably their record high uh, seatings in the poll, both of them between 22 to 25. And none of them is breaking this glass ceiling of 25 mandates, meaning that it is going to be very, very difficult for any one of them to form a stable coalition, and that it's going to be a very challenging, probably long period till we see a new 
new government sworn in in Israel. And Netanyahu invokes Jerusalem, as always. Well, the Palestinian issue made a surprise comeback to the campaign right. over the weekend because there was a leaked document of concessions, a concession document that Netanyahu supposedly agreed to in the back channel negotiations uh, with the Palestinians in 2013. Netanyahu had to react immediately to show, um, to, to gain back the support from, from the right wing electorate. So he appears in a new uh, uh, campaign ad, which uh, he's playing Monopoly on Jerusalem and he is stressing, I will not give up Jerusalem. You know who will be giving up Jerusalem? Of course, Tipi Livni and Isaac Herzog. Yeah, that's the way it is, it is uh, in this campaign. It is so interesting, Jacob, to note that even as we speak, and Tal is speaking, for our audience to understand that both contenders do not garner even a quarter of the population. It is, if we have 24 seats, it means in Israel it's 20 percent of the voters. That's the system. And that's the system. But it's not, it was not always the case, which means that no one comes with a mandate as we speak. And the coalition building, this whole idea of strategic voting is becoming so essential in Israeli politics. And we count every vote now, which is, which is a real story of this election. We'll meet again here, and it's going to be interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Shine Tan Shalev. Tal Shalev, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I spoke this week with uh, ADL National Director Abe Foxman at the APAC uh, conference in Washington. I asked him how divided was the Jewish community on the issue of Netanyahu's speech in Congress. I think the Jewish community is uncomfortable. Uncomfortable to be put in a position where there are partisan players in, in, in the game of support for Israel, especially on such an issue. But I will say to you, I think more uncomfortable are Democratic members of Congress because they want to stand with Israel. They want to be supportive. They have constituencies who want them to be supportive. Initially, uh, you have criticized Netanyahu's plan to appear before Congress. Do you think uh, this will seriously damage the relationship between Israel and the United States uh, for the long run? Uh, the question will always be, was it a deliberate mistake or was it, uh, was it not, you know, really planned to make this partisan? Somebody will write a book or two later. No, I think it's a, it's a blip in the relationship. Look, again, on the issue, these are two friends, two allies, united on the same goal. Here, as the prime minister spelled out, in that neighborhood, in the crisis situation, there's nobody closer. So, okay, so this is a faux pas. Let's say it's a deliberate uh, effort to play partisanship. Let's say it's part of the campaign. Let's say the worst. At the end of the day, uh, Israel and the United States are friends, allies, not enemies. And in this neighborhood and in this situation, they need to be much closer. Abe hey, Foxman, thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Aaron Miller served six secretaries of state as an advisor on Arab-Israeli negotiations. Currently, he is with the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. He joins us from there. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Now, uh, looks like the Netanyahu speech had at least some impact in Washington. I think you have to understand how unprecedented uh, an event this actually was. I mean, I've watched and participated in helping to shape the U.S.-Israeli relationship uh, for a almost a 25-year period, and never have I witnessed an event such as this. And just to step back for a moment to understand what we are looking at, uh, you had a, an Israeli prime minister invited by the leadership of, of a single American political party to a joint meeting. It wasn't a joint session, a joint meeting of Congress at a time when an American secretary of state is negotiating what could be the end game uh, on Iran. Um, on behalf of an administration with whom the prime minister has fundamental disagreements on both the direction and the, uh, the policy uh, with respect to how to restrain, eliminate, curtail Iran's putative nuclear weapons aspirations. This event was truly remarkable. And it, uh, the prime minister delivered clearly a, uh, a heartfelt, powerful speech. Uh, the question is, in the end, what was the investment worth the return? Well, according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, the support for the Iran bill now approaching a veto-proof majority. There really isn't enough information right now to take the full measure of that. You, you saw what happened when uh, <clears throat> Mitch McConnell tried to put onto the floor the uh, Iran uh, Negotiations Review Act. 
the Democrats, uh, uh, Robert Menendez in particular, was um, offended by the fact that there was no consultation. They've agreed to defer any additional legislation until after March 24th, which is the end date by which this framework agreement is supposed to have been reached. So I, I think in the end, you, you, you do have to raise the question, even though we do not know the answer to, to various aspects of it, whether the investment the prime minister made, the risks that he took, will be justified uh, by the return. And we don't know, frankly. Uh, it's, uh, it's a story that, that uh, does not yet have an ending. Maybe part of the problem is that the Obama administration's achievements in the Middle East are not that great. Uh, so many Israelis, for example, feel that he will not deliver on Iran. Well, I think the, uh, that President Obama is not Bill Clinton or George W. Bush. I mean, uh, I saw a recent poll which indicated that the majority of Israelis thought the president was wrong on both the Palestinian and the Iranian issues. That may, may well be the case. Um, but again, <clears throat> the question is how to measure such a thing and what ultimately will, will the impact be if, in fact, there's an agreement reached, an uh, agreement in, in principle, um, and a comprehensive accord negotiated by July 1, which is ratified or um, um, seconded by uh, the, the other members of the, of the negotiating group, the Russians, the Chinese, the Brits, the French, and the Germans seems to me that it's going to be, whether it's a good deal or a bad deal, uh, it seems to me that um, it will be a deal, and it will probably represent the kind of consensus that is going to be extremely difficult uh, to oppose. I don't know, uh, you know, the, the Iran uh, Negotiations Review Act compels the president to submit to Congress any agreement and then it allows for a 60-day period in which Congress will have to review it, during which the president is prevented from lifting or suspending any sanctions. The problem is the president will clearly veto that. Whether or not there are enough votes to override that veto is simply not clear. And I, I, I don't think we know the answer to that question. But in terms of your initial question, whether that's the problem or not, I don't know. It's a reality. There is a great deal of concern among many Israelis about the wisdom and efficacy of American policy in the Middle East. There's no doubt about that. Right. Mr. Aaron Miller in Washington, thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's uh, switch now to technology, to Barcelona to be exact, where the biggest mobile conference in the world took place this week. We are joined by Samantha Murphy, a tech reporter at Mashable.com. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, Samantha, what uh, was the main highlight this year in Barcelona? So I think the biggest news to come out of the event was the launch of Samsung's two new flagship devices. The first one was the Samsung Galaxy S6 and the uh, its sibling, kind of a sleeker look, uh, the 6S uh, Edge. And the reason why it's called the Edge is on two sides there are a curved screen and it's sort of like a different um, way for you to go in and get some uh, apps and widgets. There's lots of calendar updates in there and notifications. So those were the two biggest announcements from Samsung. What was really interesting at the show was, uh, you know, all the major players are there. Samsung, HTC, LG, uh, so many different companies. Um, but Apple was not there and they never go to the show. It's they do their own thing. They have their own product launches. But, you know, as usual, uh, everyone was kind of comparing what we saw there to what Apple was doing. So everybody is kind of uh, modeling things off of Apple, which, of course, we've seen before. But it was very noticeable this year, uh, especially since, of course, Apple never goes. They weren't there. Yeah, which is amazing by itself. So who made the strongest impression um, on this show? So a lot of the early hands-on that people had time with the devices uh, seemed to really like it. It's sleeker, works really well. Um, overall, there, uh, you know, people are trying to decide whether or not the curved screens and certain things are gimmicky or they actually do uh, impact your usability. Um, so I think that's sort of up for debate, but it's a very um, sharp-looking device, and 
And uh, considering how many Samsung Android users there are out there, this is definitely a device that people will want. Uh, it's gotten a lot better reviews than the S5, the previous model, uh, and there's a ton of potential here. So I think, you know, it, it didn't really come in with a huge splash. It's not like everybody is talking about one feature or one thing, um, but it's certainly um, a very, uh, you know, standout piece of technology. Everything is getting sleeker. It's getting uh, more fashionable. And a lot of these um, watches really actually look like watches now, which is a huge difference from what we saw just a year ago when, again, it just looked like a piece of technology that you had on your wrist. Thank you very much, Samantha Murphy in Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. And this has been The World This Week. We'll see you here next Sunday. Have a great week.